In this last section, I will give you insight to some additional developments. Yes, IEEE was quite active there. The 802.15, there are some more standards covering coexistence. I will come back to this in some more detail. The three uh, working group covering higher data rates. But you see, well, isn't this rather a wireless LAN? Sure, they want to have lower power, lower cost. You see, there are some conflicts between these working groups. And uh, if you see what happened, 3A withdrawn and not all of the groups were successful. You will not find products for all these groups. And you see the list of different groups, how active they were for all different purposes. Some of them are completed, some in hibernation, some withdrawn. There's an additional development I will focus on. That's the 802.15.4.1 was the beginning of Bluetooth. Dot four was the idea of having even lower data rates and very, very, very low power. So whatever this is. So the idea was, can't we have something with multi-year battery life, very low complexity? And you see the focus was not on cable replacement, headsets, keyboards, but more the sensors, but also toys with very low latency, remote controllers, for example, home automation. 200, 100 kilobit per second, low latency. And the support of many, many more nodes. That was one of the ideas. We are back to a more collision avoidance scheme. It should be automatic network establishment. This is just a list of ideas and requirements. Very low power. Well, it could operate in different frequency bands, you see 902.4. And that was basically the starting of the Zigbee technology. Zigbee, quite successful when it comes to Internet of Things, to home automation. So many controllers integrate this protocol. So in the relation between the .15.4 to Zigbee, similar to .15.1 to Bluetooth. There are also some initial members pushing this. Today, more than 260 whatever uh, members and promoters and participants, etc. The difference is that you usually will not get all the specification. It's not as open as the wireless LAN, for example. IEEE covers the lower layers and Zigbee then covers the higher layers of the protocol stacks and the applications. So that is the first idea of having something really targeted towards Internet of Things, low power devices. So just from the Zigbee Alliance, just quick look at the spec. Okay, it should be self-forming, self-healing mesh network, supporting many devices. That's interesting. Well, medium data rates, that's not that important here. Good encryption, well, more than 100 meters. That's quite good. A lot of sleeping, a lot of low power support. So that was that's the idea. Now, what is the difference to, for example, Bluetooth low energy? Isn't Bluetooth low energy also ultra low power and long sleeping and whatever? Well, there's some overlapping, but the idea here is really to support many, many more devices and devices with special capabilities that are geared towards this home automation, Internet of Things, industrial Internet of Things, uh, well, ultra low power devices that even do something like energy harvesting. That means they get their power from the environment. So this is really low, low power. Just an insight how it works. So it's a mesh network, self-organizing, self-healing. What does it mean? Well, have a look at this network. If there's a problem, with a connection somewhere, traffic is automatically rerouted. That's this self-healing characteristic. 
So there's also some tolerance against interference. But how does it now work? You have different types of devices. Very, very, very simple ant devices. Here, a simple sensor, battery powered. So this very simple sensor has a single parent, cannot route traffic. So that means no traffic forwarding over this node in the network. So these are really at the edge of the network. So these are the end devices. The end devices typically are so-called reduced function devices. They talk only to the parents and sleep a lot. They can be so-called full function devices. So they are mains powered, that's different, no battery. And full function devices are usually always on. But it's quite common to have a simple sensor there. Battery powered sensor or solar cell powered, whatever. Then we have routers shown here in blue. The Zigbee routers, they are full function devices, mains powered. They can route traffic. So they are quite important to create the mesh network always on. And we can have a coordinator. There's also a way of distributing this function, but usually you have a coordinator owning the network, setting certain security parameters. That's a typical setting covering thousands of nodes for industrial building, for an office building. So this is what Zigbee is used for using this mesh protocol and also being able to cover longer communication ranges. So full mesh deployment can then cover several kilometers if you just relay the data. So that is the idea. Zigbee is not made for whatever video transmission, things like this. This is really for automating buildings, for example. And you will find Zigbee in thermostats, in many different types of sensors, in uh, home surveillance systems, etc. IEEE developed many more standards, alternate physical layers, uh, and also visible light communications, body area networks, etc., etc. Again, we do not have products for all these standards, all these ideas. There are even some more major standards. You may have heard of WiMAX, Broadband Wireless Access, 802.16. This is just to complete the picture. Well, basically, this is that due to LTE. So we have LTE today, so we don't really need another wide area broadband solution. There are some more groups or were some groups, wireless coexistent, broadband working groups, etc., regional area networks. But as we have LTE and the developments there, I doubt that we will see a lot there. On the other hand, not to forget, to make it complete, we have very simple radio frequency controllers also operating in ISM bands, garage door openers, things like this. Not really much contribution to mobile communication, but still, it's there. A lot of products, proprietary systems operating there at 433 or 868 megahertz, etc. So a lot is going on in the ISM bands. What else? Microwave ovens, microwave lighting. See new light bulbs, small things compared to the old ones for stadium, for example. Many different standards. See, there are even old surveillance systems operating analog transmission, metropolitan air networks, etc. It's unlicensed, so what? So there are a lot of different levels for interference. A physical layer, physical layer that means you have a lot of interference acting as noise. So yes, we do have spread spectrum, we have this frequency hopping, we try to correct data using forward error correction, but still we have a lot of interference. And then we have a not harmonized MAC layer. So layer one problems, layer two problems. So for example, Bluetooth might confuse the wireless lens. Why? There is no carrier sensing. Bluetooth does not know anything about carrier sensing. Bluetooth doesn't care. So what does it mean? In the very early days of Bluetooth, we saw a lot of work there going on. And many said, well, Bluetooth acts like a rock member in this network. So you don't know these gaps. You learn something about this DCF interframe spaces. 
And the wireless LAN here showing three channels separated by installation. On the y-axis you see the channels, the frequencies, on the x-axis the time. And the three channels operate, there's no interference, very nice, you see data transmission, short interframe space, acknowledgement, the DCF interframe space, data transmission. So very simple scheme. Now what happens if you have Bluetooth? Well, you have 79 channels and you have the hopping and you stay for 625 microseconds on a channel. And then there's the next Bluetooth network. So it might be the case that, for example, here, the carrier sensing tells you this clear channel assessment of wireless LANs will tell you, sorry, the channel is occupied by someone, not knowing that this is Bluetooth. And then the wireless LAN stops sending. So there was a discussion in IEEE the, as a standard, and one of the proposals is the so-called adaptive frequency hopping, so that you adapt the hopping pattern of Bluetooth to avoid this. A lot of testing, many different opinions, calculations, and some papers say uh, the network breaks completely down, and the other said there's almost no effect, and this seems that frequency hopping is more robust, uh, the Bluetooth is more robust compared to the direct sequence spread spectrum at that time, the dot eleven b standard. And indeed, if you look into the spectrum, we see here the classical Bluetooth with these 79 channels. We see Bluetooth low energy. You see our channels are advertisement here, advertisement channels here, and here the advertisement channels, complete different layout, but also operating at 2.4. Then we have Zigbee, Zigbee, 16 channels, also operating there with a complete different channel spacing. Okay, and then we have this very friendly wireless LAN with these three non-overlapping channels. And as soon as there's a lot going on here at low energy or at the Bluetooth hopping through the spectrum, somehow there might be a problem for the wireless LAN. So that the carrier sensing tells there's something going on, a Zigbee, a Bluetooth lower energy, a Bluetooth basic rate enhanced data rate transmission. Wireless LAN does not know. But the problem is the behavior of Bluetooth and Zigbee, not of wireless LAN, because the wireless LAN is the friendly one doing this carrier sensing. But what is the solution? So. As example, Bluetooth, what is done today? There's this adaptive frequency hopping. So Bluetooth says, okay, you can reduce the number of channels you use. You have to use at least 20 out of the 79. Avoiding, for example, the channel your laptop uses for wireless LAN. Then you hop only on the other channels. So if you look at your spectrum, there's this wide wireless LAN channel you use and then there is the Bluetooth now just hopping here in these channels avoiding your wireless LAN channel. But what happens if you use all the channels etc etc. Your neighbors, we had this discussion talking about the wireless LANs. There's also a way that the host, your laptop, tells the Bluetooth controllers which channel is occupied by wireless LAN. There's a way of retransmitting data in the SEO. So if data is destroyed, there's also a way of aligning the clock with, for example, the LTE clock and uh, different devices can exchange available time slots. So there are different mechanisms in the Bluetooth standard to well minimize at least interference. You cannot really avoid it, at least to minimize it. Okay, finally some questions. So look at the different developments and then you find these overlapping goals, competing standards. And this is also reason why not all the standards are really successful in products because industry will not come up with products that will kill other products. What was the main purpose of Zigbee? yet another standard and quite successful. What are key characteristics of the networks and what are the differences to Bluetooth, Bluetooth low energy? And finally, how can we avoid 
interference, what are some of the solutions at least Bluetooth offers?